Good morning. Welcome to the College Church. And for those who are joining us on live stream, welcome. And I got to tell you, for those who are maybe are not in the area of Lancaster Clinton, maybe you're live streaming, what a beautiful day. Does anybody here feel like handing out empty bags this afternoon on a beautiful fall day? <laughs> We have a few thousand of them, and that's going to be discussed later on. Grace will talk about that a little bit. But what a beautiful day. I mean, really think about that. Now, as we're here, I want to ask a trivia question. Does anybody know what happened on this day in history? Anybody want to take a guess? Well, I had an advantage because I, I had a moment to prepare. In 1886, the Statue of Liberty opened up. Think about that. And of course, we know the famous words there, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. Now, that was 1886. Here we are, 2023. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. And he said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. My friend, that is the joy that we have today, to serve the Lord who says, come unto me and I will give you rest. It's our hope and our prayer that this worship service will help all of us in that journey of connecting with our Lord, of accepting him as Lord and Savior, and of course, accepting him as the one who calls us by his name and who invites us to a new and amazing life. So we're offering this, this time of prelude, time to just sort of put aside all the noise of the world, of the, of the week, and just meditate, talk to the Lord, to um, read, his, read the book, and to just focus in on what we're able to do now, to worship the Lord as a church family.
Good morning, church. Our call to worship is found at number 852 in your hymnal. I will read the light print and we will read the bold print together. O oh God, you are our God. Earnestly we seek you today. Our, soul, our souls thirst for you. Our whole being longs for you. Because we have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory, we can respond. Lord, your love is better than life itself, and we declare that our lips will glorify you. We will praise you as long as we live, and in your name we will lift up our hands to do your work. Lord, we will be satisfied if you free us, and we will now sing praises to your name. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for those who are able to be here, and we ask that you be with those who cannot be here. We also ask that you be with us now as we worship you. Open our hearts to your message and turn our minds to the things you want us to pay attention to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. on all right so my name is Linnea this is Ibis this is Ibis uh, he's a guinea pig um, my story is not about a guinea pig my story is about a hamster yes you've heard this um, so I've had a lot of hamsters growing up I think I've had about six of them now hamsters don't tend to live very long so I'm going to tell a story about one of my hamsters. Um, this hamster's name was Spice. I got her from PetSmart. Um, 
when I got her, I didn't, I don't think I really noticed anything was wrong with her. But um, when I got home, I quickly realized something was wrong with her. Uh, she didn't have any teeth. Her face was quite flat. Her eyes were on the front of her face, not the side. And um, she screamed when you picked her up. She screamed very loudly. So I couldn't take very good care of this hamster like I would my other hamsters. So I had to take do special care of her. She, my other hamsters had these tubes they could go in. Um, she would get stuck in them because she would try to turn around while she was in them. So I got her a special tube that was wide enough for her to be able to turn around in. And I didn't hold her that much because she would scream and didn't seem to make her very happy. So I had this hamster for about two weeks. Now, when I got her, my grandmother offered to let me take her back and exchange her for a hamster that worked right and a hamster that would let me hold her. Uh, I didn't think this would be very fair to the hamster because I didn't think anybody else would take very good care of her. So I chose to keep her. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but she lived two weeks. She didn't really, I would like to think she had a good life, but I can't really say. But um, the point of this is my hamster didn't work right, but I didn't return her. Now, if you don't work right, or if you're a little different than anybody else, your parents aren't gonna return you, they're gonna keep you because they love you, right? They love you just like I love that hamster and just like God loves you. Now, if you think you're a little different, or if you think that God might not love you as much, he does. He won't return you and he'll keep you just the way you are because that's what he does. He loves everybody. And that's kind of the end of my story. Do you want to play some music? Good morning. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things in the bulletin, and then I'm going to turn the time over to Grace to talk to you about something that's very important. In your bulletin, we have our second reading for membership transfers for Tom and Sherry Lynn Olson to the Crosswalk Company of West Boylston. At this time, I would entertain a motion to accept that. I have a motion. Do I have a second? All in favor, please raise your hand. And it passes. Thank you very much. A lot of things happening here today. At 4 o'clock this afternoon for the kids, there is a special treat called Nailed It. It will be right here from 4 to 6. And then down at SLA, there is the Fall Festival starting at 7 o'clock. You will notice that we have the Operation Christmas Child that is in full swing. And we encourage you to take a box and consider donating that to help someone out and help them have a better Christmas. Also want to point your attention to the Max Rager Festival, which is coming to the Worcester area in celebration of 150 years, and we hope that you will look at those and consider attending one or more of those. We are, as we have said many times, a blessed congregation to have so many talented musicians in our congregation, and some of them will be participating in that, and we encourage you to support them as well. And now Grace is going to tell you about our food drive. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today we have been blessed with beautiful weather, which is perfect since today we'll be passing out the paper bags for the holiday food drive after church. This is a really important piece of the holiday food drive because we get a lot of our food donations from the generous people of our community. Please consider helping us and have a wonderful, a wonderful Sabbath, and I hope you enjoy the beautiful day God has given us. Thank you.
invite you to kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come to you with praise. We come to you to magnify your name. We recognize that you're the king of the universe. Everything we see, everything we touch belongs to you. And so we offer our time, our hearts, and our minds right now as sacrifices, as offerings to you. May you use them and direct them as you will. We ask in particular, Lord, that you guide our hearts and our minds, as we discussed in Sabbath school today, towards accomplishing your mission in this world. And that it starts with being a loving, welcoming congregation, community, family. Make this church a family, Lord. Lord, we lift up those in our church family who are suffering from various forms of illness, financial trouble, family trouble, relationships, all the consequences of sin. And we ask, Lord, that you comfort them, but also, Lord, give this congregation and its members and its leaders the insight and the courage to minister to one another as each member needs. Help us to meet the needs of our members. In particular, Lord, we pray for a name, Mary Monroe, who came before us this morning and over the last few days. Uh, she's in the hospital, Lord, um, in a particular situation, and I pray that you will comfort her. I pray that if it be your will, that you will heal, heal her of what's causing her problems, be with her family, and help us, Lord, as a church to uh, minister her, to her and her family in this difficult time. We pray, Lord, for this world in general and its leaders, in particular, we pray, pray for two parts of the world where there's conflict. We pray for the Ukraine, as we have been for some time. We pray, Lord, for the Middle East, the place where you walked when you were on this earth. And you know from personal experience, from being there, that it's always been a place of conflict. But we pray, Lord, that it can now be a revelation of peace somehow. I pray, Lord, for the the political leaders, the soldiers, the civilians, the victims, and the perpetrators. However one chooses to define those terms, I pray for them all. And I pray that somehow through this conflict that people can know and understand that you love them and that you sent your son to retrieve them. I pray for this church, this congregation, our denomination, that we can be a shining light and that we will properly represent you. I pray for the forgiveness of the sins of every person in this room and prepare us now, Lord, to receive your word and to continue our worship service. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm going to be doing the scripture reading. Um, James 1, 19 through 27. Please turn in your Bibles. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom 
and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. Happy Sabbath. In this song, we're going to be repeating what Jerlyn says. Salvador, we will be singing for you, I can do everything.
watching them do their hand motions made me, reminded me of a home video I have from when I was maybe a little around that age. And I decided to, to do the motions to a beat of a different drummer. So when everybody was doing this, I was doing this, and when they were doing this, I was doing that. But at any rate, it was, uh, it was very cute. So, and that was meaningful, the words, and, and it put a smile on my face. And it's really good to be here for sure. So, so I just want to mention real quick that in your bulletin, uh, there's a whole schedule for the holiday food drive. So if you can't help out today, it's right there. And it's a, just a wonderful time to be involved. And the community takes notice, and people take notice. And it's something that really affects people, and of course, it affects us. So let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this time of year. Thank you for this time of year. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this beautiful truth that we know and we love. And sometimes it even challenges us. And Lord, we pray that your spirit, the same Holy Spirit who was with, present on this earth when you were here physically, will be with us now. Br draw to our minds and to our hearts the things that we need to be aware of, need to be in the forefront of our attention. We pray that you will speak to each of us right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the coming three days, my friends, 2.4 million adults will dress up as vampires. 2.4 million. 5.8 million and 1.4 million children, 5.8 million adults, 1.4 million children will dress up as witches. 18% of people say they will visit a haunted house. And $3.5 billion will be consumed thanks to Halloween. What should we be afraid of? What should we be afraid of? Ghosts and goblins? Ouija boards? Haunted houses? or maybe sugar highs and cavities. What should the Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ, be afraid of? Well, when I read through the Bible, there's a couple of texts that kind of haunt me a little bit, one of which is when Jesus is at the second coming, and he says, go away from me, I never, what? Knew you. Or how about Revelation 20, verse 15? Anyone whose name was not found written the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire and then then there is James chapter 2 verse 17 which reminds us that faith without works is what it's dead it's dead turn with me to that book the book of James James is is we believe is the brother we technically should say the half brother of Jesus and, and James, is, it's, it's very important to get a grasp about who James is because James was a biological brother, half-brother of Jesus Christ, but when Jesus, we believe, when, was, when he was growing up, James didn't think that Jesus was the Messiah. It wasn't until, we believe, after the resurrection that James began to put the pieces together and began to say, aha, this really is God. Now, he authors this book, and I hope we've all read this book, because it's a very, very, very practical book. It's so practical that some people say this is basically the book of Proverbs dressed up in New Testament clothing. And, and it, it, it ch challenges us. Wherever you are in the spiritual journey, it will challenge you. It will step on your toes. It steps on mine all the time. And so there's just a little part here that we're going to focus on and about what should we be afraid of? What should we be afraid of? And as I looked at this passage, and, and there's a whole lot more things to be afraid of, I came up with three simple points. Fear number one is majoring in the minors. Do Christians ever major in the minors? Do we ever make mountains out of molehills? Do we ever say every hill is worth dying on? Do we ever do that? Of course we do. 
The second thing to be afraid of is having truth without transformation in our lives. That's scary. And thirdly, we could say it's having relationships without real religion, or we should say having real religion without relationships. So with that, let's dive into James chapter 1, verse 19. James is writing this, and he says here, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, we all know it, but sometimes it's good to quantify it. WBZ did a survey or or report about a survey not long ago where 84% of people say that Americans are angrier now than they were a generation ago. Is that true? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And a matter of fact, 42% of, of people admitted they themselves were more angry than they were a year ago, several years ago. And why is that? Why is that? Well, I believe it comes down to three issues. Limited time, limited resources, and limited knowledge. Limited time, limited resources, limited knowledge. I mean, one of those resources is, of course, money. And, and it's interesting, I was reading one of the home pages, and, and, and I, just there, I just could not believe how quickly this happened. But Taylor Swift is now a billionaire. Billion. I thought she maybe had $10 million. <laughs> maybe $15 million. A billion. $1.1 billion. That's right, wow. <laughs> and, and I don't mean anything bad on her, I don't wish anything bad on Taylor Swift, but what I'm saying is, is what's going on now is the world is seeing this amazing gap that is developing right before our eyes in real time between the ultra-rich, the middle class, and the poor. It's just happening. We're watching it real time. And so many people, their anger, their frustration is that there isn't enough money. The other thing we're angry about, of course, is a broken political system. Can I hear an amen about that? It's crazy, isn't it? It is totally out of control. Social media. Social media. Not to mention the fact that we have two wars going on right now, Ukraine and, of course, the Middle East. Not to mention that there was a a former president who is facing a truckload of indictments, not to mention the fact that we are just simply stressed to the max. And we have the, the, the shooting that happened two and a half hours or two and a half hours away from here just this past week. We went through a pandemic that changed everything, everything. And we are stressed. And so this leads to anger. It's a perfect place for it and we find ourselves needling each other and sometimes I feel like we look for an excuse to say now it's my turn to be angry. I have the right to be angry because this person accidentally cut in front of me even though you know probably was just an accident. And so James is dealing with this. James is dealing with this because this isn't the first time we've been angry. Is it? It's not the first time we've been angry. It's we've been angry for a long, long time. And so he says here, be careful about this human anger because it doesn't doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, it's interesting that James understands something about human nature. He knows that sometimes, sometimes we act out of emotion and not out of principle. Anybody understand that? We just act out of emotion, and we just let let that determine what we're going to do. And James understands that. He says so often it's easy for us to just let emotions take over, and you know what happens? It doesn't produce anything that is right. Now, it's interesting because probably, probably James is remembering Micah 6, 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of these, right? 
but to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Anger. What doing what is right. Now here in the, uh, he mentions here to do righteousness. Now it's easy for us to look through this uh, through the lens of Paul, but we need not do that. Think of it in terms of a man who was Jewish, related to Jesus Christ, and he ex- realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. Now for him, he would be more like, this is the good thing to do, this is the justice thing to do, this is the fair thing to do. And so he's telling the reader, he's saying, look, this human anger, it doesn't go down the right road. It doesn't produce the rightness, the justice, the fairness that God wants. And so he says, in, in, to response, therefore get rid of the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and, humbly, uh, prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now I mentioned here about the three sources of our fears or anger. Limited time, limited resources, limited knowledge. This is where I want to use our little imagination for a moment here and sancti- hopefully sanctify it here. If James is writing this, and he remembers, yeah, you know what? I remember Jesus. He was kind of an oddball. When we were growing up, Jesus was kind of an oddball. He was kind of different. And he said, you know, I remember this one trip we went to the beach, and we only had a couple hours, and we had a little plastic pail with the plastic uh, shovel, and we only had one, but there was, I don't know how many, let's just make up a number, six of us. We only had a few hours, and we'd go down to the beach, and we all wanted to use it because we only had a few hours, and we all wanted to build a stand castle. And you know what happened? We fought over that. We fought over that bucket and that cheap, you know what I'm talking about, those shovels, and they break the first time you put it in the sand, and and it's worth nothing. And so we, we fought over that, and it broke. And none of us could use it. But Jesus, for whatever reason, wasn't in that fight. Now James is thinking about this, says, aha, I'm beginning to understand this. You see, Jesus came out of the grave. (laughs) Jesus came out of the grave. He he emerged from the grave. He saw him. He said, this happened. And so once that, uh, that sinks into James, it's as if everything changes. This idea of there being limited time, limited resources, and limited knowledge, it's out the window. Because so much of what we do is trying to beat the clock. I got to get this in before I go six feet under and pushing up the daisies. The day is coming to an end, and I'm thinking here about this hypothetical situation where the beach, and and they said, we only got three hours, and they're fighting over the bucket because they all want to be able to use it, and then he now realizes, wait a second. If Jesus conquered death, the limited resources issue is no longer an issue. It is no longer an issue. The limited resources? I mean, my brother fed 5,000 people from a few fish and loaves of bread. I think he can make a whole planet full of buckets with shovels that won't break when you put it in the sand. And, And as far as time goes, we could play on the beach for years, for years. And it's as if James is saying, this changes everything. This actually changes everything. This changes it all. And so it's as if so often we say, stake your future on Christ. But now he's saying, don't stake your future on Christ. Stake your present on Christ. And that's the rub of James, is how it actually says, this is not about the future moment. This is about how to live right here, right now. And James has had this paradigm shift. His eyes have been opened. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he sits down and says, oh my goodness. 
I was squabbling over a bucket, a plastic bucket, with a cheap plastic shovel when I didn't realize what was really going on, what we're a part of. And so James says, okay, listen, if you understand that, let's aim for what God wants. Let's aim for that righteousness that God desires. So what we got to do is we got to jettison some moral stuff and the evil, and we've got to humbly accept the word planted in you. Now, it's interesting because I get rid of all moral filth and evil. Now that's a, really a springboard for what I would hate to say called pandering. You could just say, oh, look at all the evil things happening in the world. And you could go down the standard laundry list, but the, that's not, that would miss the point. Because the evil can be in me, can be in all of us, in just how we see the world, and that I've got I've to uh, fight for my little piece of the pie. I'm thinking about the Ukraine situation. Putin invades it. The price? So far, 300,000 Russian soldiers dead. 300,000 soldiers dead. Why? Why? Limited resources. He wants access to, to the water. He also knows that's the, essentially the breadbasket of the region. I mean, you've got the Ukraine, you've got wheat. I mean, that's a resource. And then I'm thinking, I'm sure not on Putin's yacht, I'm sure not in one of his mansions, I'm sure not on his train, I'm sure though somewhere deep inside the Kremlin, there is a book. Oh, nobody reads it. Nobody goes to it. But it's called the Bible. And if he would open it up in one humble second, he would read the Beatitudes where it says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Wow. That's a game changer, isn't it? That is a game changer. And, and I believe James has understood this. He's had his eyes opened, at least partially. He says, oh my goodness. Oh my God, what have I been doing? And it says, this is, this is, and he essentially, when you read the book of James, it's like, okay, James is saying, you ain't a rom, you're a child of God, now act like it. Act like it. And this is where it steps on my toes and perhaps yours as well. And so it's like we, we, we he tells us to, to, to get rid of some things. Maybe you've heard about the story about a young soldier who was in training boot camp. He was assigned to, to KP duty, and the sergeant said, here's a pile of potatoes, and I want you to sort them out. You put the bad ones over here, you put the good ones over here. So sergeant leaves, and two hours later he returns, only to find this young recruit. The, bucket, the pile's still there, there's the, the two buckets are totally empty, and he's staring at one potato. He's staring at one potato. And he says, didn't you like your job? Didn't like what you like what you had to do? It's a pretty easy thing. And it's just, he said, no, the problem is I just can't make a decision. <laughs> now I'm saying that because we all are faced with decisions. And as they often say, to decide is to not decide, right? And so James is saying, saying, we, there's something we've got to get rid of. We've got to weed it out of our hearts. We've got to sort it out. And then he says, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now that's an interesting statement. Humbly accept the word planted in you. What imagery comes to mind? A plant, right? A tree. And I think James understood something about following Jesus Christ. It's a living relationship. And any plant we have, and I'm sure we've all killed one or two in our lifetimes, that requires water and light and air, right? And fertilizer and maybe cultivation. And it's so easy for us to forget that. And it's as if James is saying the word is planted in you. 
Let it grow. Let it thrive. Let it expand. Let it develop. Let the fruit come out of it. And my friends, you and I have decisions every single day of our lives. I came across a story about a professor named Elliot and his father, so it's Elliot's father and uncle, were, were children of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this is going back years and years ago, the story's told, and, and they were walking out on Nashon Island, which is off of Woods Hole, and they're walking there, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Professor Elliot, where he was a little kid then, or his father, and then the uncle of Elliot, are walking there. Elliot's father is, is about six years old. They're walking along the island, and in a pure moment, by the way, he realized that this man he's walking with, his grandfather, is a great man. He's a great man. Did you know that he can just pick up, even though he's six years old, he knows there's something about it, about him. So he finds a little buttercup, he picks it, and he goes to Ralph Waldo Emerson and proudly says, look, Grandpa, a buttercup. And his older, smart-alecky brother, named Cameron of all the names, <laughs> says, of course, Grandfather knows that's a buttercup. And in that one moment, a one beautiful, fragile, naive, perfect moment. It wasn't just the buttercup that was crushed. Why? And I say this, Lord, because that brother who gave the buttercup to his grandfather, they lived to be in their 90s and would later confess, you know, I've never forgotten that and I've sort of never forgiven my brother for that moment. Now, what was going on there? You've got to make a decision. You have to choose. And James understands that. And he says, we've got to sort this out and get rid of some of this moral filth, the evil, and, 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 and we need to humbly accept the word that's planted in us, which can save us. And we so often look at the end result. Oh, am I going to, is my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or not? Am I going to be saved? We sometimes forget it's about how are we going to live today, tomorrow, next month, next year. It's saving us from some of the chaos and the messiness and the insanity of this world. So, so, so James goes on in verse 22. So don't, do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I got to tell you, how many here remember uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Remember that book, Stephen Covey? Yep. It was a bestseller back in the 80s, and it became so popular that somebody came upon, made a spoof of it. And so instead of seven habits of highly effective people, they came up with seven habits of highly defective people. <laughs> and we're not going to go through them all, but it's interesting. Point practice number one is me, me, me. Me, me, me. That's it. Highly defective person. And the seventh one is a simple word I know we all grapple with. It's called procrastination. Seven habits of highly defective people. James says, do what it says. Do what it says. And he says, it goes on to say here, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues it, not forgetting that they have not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed. They will be blessed by what they do. They will be blessed by what they do. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Essentially, listen and do, repeat, listen and do, repeat, listen and do, repeat, listen and do, repeat. I've got to tell you a story that doesn't reflect that well on clergy. In case you haven't noticed, we, don't, we, have, we haven't achieved, achieved perfection. But it was a seminary story and where the professor told the class 
okay, overnight, I want to give you some homework assignment. I want you to do an ex a careful exegetical study of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, which is the story of the Good Samaritan. Tell them, go home. I want you to study it. I want you to come prepared tomorrow. We're going to have a quiz on it, and, and we're going to discuss it. So they go home, and in the meantime, there was something going on behind the scenes. Three individuals got together. One of them was a seminarian. He put on some old clothes. They ripped it up. They put some fake blood on him. And you may have heard the story that he was laying in front of the seminary the next day. Two of his partners were in the bushes hiding to see what would happen. And you may know it's a sad commentary. Because one by one, those seminarians walked right past him or sometimes even over him without asking the question, are you okay? James says, don't merely listen to the word. Do what it says. Do what it says. Do what it says. And that's where it gets to be gutsy for me and you, doesn't it? Because that gets us into uncomfortable territory. It's scary. It's scary to hope that some situation can actually change and improve. It's scary to think that maybe, maybe the world could be a little bit better if I just simply help that one person. But it takes that investment. It takes that investment. Listen and do repeat. Listen and do repeat. Listen and do repeat. Ariel Berger was an author of a book I enjoyed reading. He was a student of, of uh, Elie Wiesel. And, and he tells a story about when he had a child. He calls up Elie Wiesel on the phone and says, guess what? My daughter's been born. I'm like the happiest man in the world. And Elie Wiesel says, mazel tov to you. And he says, how are you feeling? And, and Ariel, he says, I, now I feel I have a stake in the world. Before, I cared about the world, but what was the worst that could happen? I could die. But now I feel I can't turn away from the world even for a moment. And Elie Wiesel said, of course. My son changed me profoundly. Once you bring life into the world, you must protect it by trying to make the world a better place. Our children show us that the connection between ethics and beauty, that is a beautiful uh, that it is beautiful to make the world more human. Do you know what James is trying to do? You know what Jesus is trying to do? You know what the New Testament is trying to do? Is it's help, trying to help us to be a better human being. And sometimes we are actually afraid to do just that. I read in preparation for the sermon, I was came upon a research that, that kind of offended me at first, but. It's interesting what the way this person put it. He said, sadly, some people have observed that many Christians, in despite of great teaching, great books, great Bible studies, great preaching, great studies, have merely transitioned from spiritual pampers to spiritual depends. That goes ouch, doesn't it? And I see his point. We've gone from one to the other, and we have forgotten to become as the toddler, the juvenile, the adolescent, the teen, the young adult, we've missed all that growing and maturation. And James understood that because for a moment there, he lived, he lived in the same house probably as Jesus did. And he completely misses the point. He completely misses the point. Martin Luther Martin Luther, man who started the Reformation, essentially begins, births the Lutheran church, puts it like this, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing, is worth nothing. And it's true, because what God is doing here, especially with the incarnation, he's saying, okay, let's get messy. And God is the only God we know with scars, and he came down to be one of us, and he, 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 he knows what it's exactly like to be here, and he opens to us the door. He opens up to me, to us, what does this actually look like? 
And we have this mirage that is sitting on the beach all day long and drinking a, 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 pina, a pina colada, alcohol-free, all right? That's not it. There was a pastor of a large church. He was a visitor that day and came up to the pastor and says, Hey, pastor, got a question for you. What's the advantage? What's the advantage or the benefits of being a member here? Now, that was an interesting question. Looking at Pastor Alex here, it's an interesting question. What are the benefits of being a member here? And the pastor was kind of caught off guard, and in a moment of inspiration, he said, you get to serve. You get to serve. There's a lady named Ellen White caught this. Christ Object Lessons, great book, page 86. The law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. The law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. Of self-preservation, The life that will be preserved is the life that is freely given in service to God and man. Those who for Christ's sake seek sac uh, sacrifice their life in this world will keep it unto life eternal. Is this righteousness by works? No, it isn't. It is, as they say, it is a righteousness that works. Which brings us into fear number three, like we could possibly have relationships without real religion and real religion without relationships, for it says in verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. And here, here, my friends, is the punchline. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Jesus isn't, or Jesus, James isn't saying, Find an orphan, check. Find a, a widow, check. <laughs> and find and, and remove yourself from society, check. He's not saying that. He's saying, wait a second here. Invest yourself. Invest yourself fully into other people and into service for God. Tony Dungy was the coach of the Indianapolis Colts, and he tells a very interesting parable, a fictitious parable, He's in Indianapolis. He doesn't like the New England Patriots, I don't think very much. But he tells a parable. Suppose there is a husband and wife. They live in Boston. They get, to, they get on a plane. They're touring. They're in Indianapolis. And one, part of the trip, they tour the Indianapolis Colts Stadium. He says they've gone around. They're really impressed. Really impressed. Great facilities. They see the locker rooms, they get to see the offices, they get to see behind the scenes, and, and they're really impressed, and they, they, they really begin to say, oh man, the Indianapolis Colts, they're great, it's a great team. And then he says, then they get on the plane, they land at Logan Airport, and then on their way through the terminal, they pass a gift shop, and the husband thinks for himself, you know what, I got a mustard stain on my Patriots jacket. I just can't get it out. So I'm going to buy a new one. And he walks into the gift shop and buys a new Patriots jacket. Meanwhile, his wife is on the phone ordering some uh, Patriots material herself. Now the question is that Tony Dungy asks, did they have a great visit to Indianapolis? Yes, they did. But was it life-changing? Did it get down to the core where they said, you know what, I am going to wear an Indianapolis Colts jacket from now on? No, it didn't. And it did not impact them in that way to the core. And, and I like what he says here. It is by grace, not by works, that you are saved. However, your works may shed significant light on whether you have ever had the moment of life-changing salvation that Christ offers. That's where the rubber meets the road. This is where Christ's object lessons, page 86, it brings us right down to it. 
And dare I say, my friends, the problem with Christianity today and to, with, with the way it is today, we see it as a product to be consumed. Sign on the dotted line. Sign on the dotted line and you're going to have a better life. God will turn those scars, as they say, into candy bars. <laughs> he, will he will give you all the blessing. Anything you want, he will give to you. Well, actually not. But he will invite you and me onto a journey that would never, ever, ever have happened if Jesus Christ did not leave the safety of the throne room of heaven. Would never have happened. Because he, is, he, 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 he leaves one world, comes to ours, and he immerses himself into what it actually is like to be a human being. I got close with a story about a, some words from a man who spent 27 years in prison. 27 years. For six months, for a lot of his prison time, he was allowed one letter and one visitor per, month, per six months. His, his, his number was actually 46664 was his inmate number because it was 1964 and he was the six, 466 inmate to be taken into that prison. I believe it was, uh, yeah, to be taken into that prison. His name was Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, 27 years. And when he was young, he thought he had his whole future ahead of him. He had it planned out. And then after a while, he realized he really wasn't free. He didn't have the freedom that he wanted to have. But then something else happened in the mind and the heart of Nelson Mandela. He said, I slowly saw that not only was I not free, but my brothers and sisters were not free. That is when the hunger for my own freedom became the greater hunger for the freedom of my people. Do you see what happens? He's leaving his own orb and his own solar system and entering the orb and solar system of other people. He says, it was this desire for the freedom of my people to live their lives with dignity and self-respect that animated my life and transformed a frightened young man into a bold one that drove a law-abiding attorney to become a criminal that turned a family-loving husband into a man without a home. I am no more virtuous or sacrificed than the next man, but I found that I could not even enjoy the poor, limited freedoms I was allowed when I knew my people were not free. My friends... Why did Jesus do what he did? He knew we were not free. Now the question is, what will I do in response to that real reality? Do I realize how many others are not free? How many other, others need the touch of grace? May God be with us as we strive Strive, strive, strive to put the book of James particularly into full practice. Because we're going to need help, my friends. We're going to need help. It ain't going to come naturally. But God will give us that help, that strength, each and every day. May God be with us as we seek to follow the advice here found in this book. Our hymn of dedication is number 348, The Church Has One Foundation.
just got to read those words. The church has one foundation. Tis Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this understanding. Thank you for this revelation. Thank you for the fact that a guy named James, a long time ago, wrote down, wrote down his insights about how to live. Oh, Lord, we stand in his shadows. We, we, we're at his feet. And so, Lord, we pray that as we have just looked at a small portion of this letter he wrote long ago, that you will be with us as we seek humbly to put into practice. May we realize that we are only here because you created us. We are only here because you've redeemed us. And you have indeed called us your brothers and sisters. Oh, Lord, thank you for this understanding. Thank you for this revelation. And may it indeed change the way we see one another. May it change our perspective the way we gauge and ration our time and our talents and our treasures. Thank you, Lord. Be with us. Go forth with us, Lord. May your spirit guide our thoughts and our actions. In the saving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.